Hello and welcome again to Charles Kelly Money Tips. Uh, thanks, thanks for tuning in today. If you're if you're listening on uh, my iTunes podcast or you're tuning in to uh, Facebook Live, uh, great to see you all. And hope hope you're having a, a great day. I'm, I'm broadcasting here from London, which is wet and windy today. You might hear some whirring noises, which is just the wind blowing against uh, the side of the office here. So. Uh, apologize for that but today I want to talk to you about the the UK wealth per adult and I I wanted to continue on this theme that I talked about yesterday which was that the the wealth per person in the UK has gone up it's not going down as you as you kind of would gather from the media that everything's doom and gloom and remember Zig Ziglar said that the the media has predicted 18 out of the last three recessions which you know means that if you keep saying there's going to be a recession then eventually there will be and you, we can often talk ourselves into to recessions but the UK wealth uh, per adult has actually increased by 41% since the, the last sort of 2008 financial crisis and that's according to a report by Credit Suisse that uh, uh, produces a huge report monitoring uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people's wealth and, and it goes into each country in depth. And you, you can read that online yourself. It makes very interesting reading. Uh, incidentally, which country would you think is, is the wealthiest in terms of wealth per adult? Which country would you think is the wealthiest? Just uh, maybe text me your answer there. Just just put your answer on the screen there. Which country would you consider is the wealthiest per adult in the world, which has the most adult uh, per, per person wealth. Now, glo- yesterday I said that global wealth has grown by 2.6 percent to uh, 360 trillion dollars last year. Uh, that's an awful lot of money. Uh, but the average wealth in in Britain uh, is now, you know, as I said, 41 percent more than it was in the 2000 and two, 2007 level. And did, did you know also that there are two and a half million US dollar millionaires in the UK and that that represents five percent of millionaires globally. So that, that's quite a lot of millionaires. Um, now, obviously, a million dollars in the UK will probably just about buy you a house in a big city. But it, it's still a mark of how things have moved on since uh, when, when I was growing up, when most people lived in a, a council house and uh, probably didn't aspire to even own a property. There wasn't a buy to let market because there was controlled rents and landlords were not really encouraged to to rent out properties because the rents were then controlled by the government and it was very difficult to uh, to, to, to evict a tenant and get your property back. And, and this is why the, the private rental market remained stagnant for, for decades under, under this kind of rule. And, and it looks like uh, the government are talking about bringing this back in again. You know, not maybe not this government, but certainly the opposition parties are, are advocating bringing in much tougher uh, legislation for landlords, which could send them running to the hill. Certainly, I wouldn't be renting out property if I knew that it would be extremely difficult to 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 get that property back again when I, I wanted to sell it or or maybe move into it. You know, whatever. So, but that that thing start that that type of talk is is been bandied around by several of the uh, opposition parties in this in this election campaign. Now, you may be listening to this after the election, but we're, we're a few days away from the election as as I speak now, uh, and uh, quite a few of the the opposition parties are talking about tougher regulations for landlords and this sort of stuff, and it it, it doesn't look look great. Um, I. But but that that's another subject. I mean, we can talk about that another day. But I think a lot of landlords are not even aware of the current legislation, which which is tough enough as it is. Uh, but I mean, did did you know, for instance, that uh, everyone knows all the landlords know that you need fire safety. You know, you need uh, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, and and I think that's that's fairly standard. People know that, and, and yet even then, a lot of people don't even carry this out. Yeah, they, they, you go into a house, you find there's no working uh, fire detectors and smoke detectors in, in a property. Either the batteries have run out or the tenant has switched them off because they're making too much noise. So so that's something you've got to... And did, did you know, I mean, this is something I got from the Hertfordshire Fire and uh, fire, fire, fire 
advice, fire safety advice for landlords from the Hertfordshire Fire Service, it used to be called Fire Brigade. Um, and it says here that you must carry out a fire risk assessment for each property you rent out. Did, did you know that? Um, I've done this on, on a HMO because it was part of the thing, but they're saying you must carry out a fire risk assessment for each property you rent out. What does a fire risk assessment contain? I'm not going to go into what a fire risk assessment contains. Um, and But, you know, it, it, this is not just applying to HMOs. And now, we, we've seen what can happen where things can go disastrously wrong, like in the Grenfell Tower. And if that was a private landlord, I think they would be in jail by now. But nobody is, has been put in prison uh, as, as, it, as it stands. And it, it seems to me that the fire service did not give correct advice there, uh, and they certainly uh, approved th these properties. That, and this cladding is all over uh, many buildings at the moment, this cladding that set fire. And presumably that's been approved by the, the fire safety people and, and maybe even the fire service. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, but you'd think with a big development, the fire brigade, the fire service would be involved somewhere along the line. Now, if you're a, a, a private... Uh, landlord or a private or you own a property in one of these blocks you you could face a bill of thousands of pounds to replace all of the the clad in that that, that that has been approved previously but anyway that's another subject if you're a landlord make sure you carry out a fire risk assessment so getting back to the the, the wealth that we talked about uh, we talked yesterday that there are 47 million millionaires dollar millionaires worldwide and 18 million in in the US alone uh, that, that's interesting uh, apparently, six percent of U.S. citizens are are actually millionaires now, and every year more and more millionaires are, are being created, perhaps through property values, <clears throat> maybe values of their pensions. But but most millionaires have created become millionaires by uh, by virtue of the fact that they are um, creating a business, that they've built a business. That's what creates most millionaires. So. Don't believe all the, all the doom and gloom that you, you read uh, because it can it can depress you to think that things are always bad when more and more millionaires in, every, in, in all parts of the world are being created. Don't forget we've seen uh, billions of people being taken out of poverty in China and India as the, the capitalist system there has, has made their economies boom and grow. Uh, you know, South Korea a few years ago uh, you know, not that long ago, 30, 40 years ago, was, was in pretty dire straits and, and now ranks as one of the leading economies in Southeast Asia with, you know, tremendous growth per adult. Uh, Japan also, after the war, was doing very, very badly. Uh, now th th there's tremendous wealth in those countries. So it shows what can be done with a little bit of, of hard work. Now, I ask you a question, which country has... The, the highest wealth per adult and and basically that would make it the wealthiest country in the world if you if you break it down per adult maybe not the biggest economy but the wealthiest country in the world which country is that that's switzerland yes little old switzerland uh is is the wealthiest country and i'll, I'll give you a few facts about switzerland um, average wealth uh per adult is 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 around about half a million dollars per adult and you know that that's a, that's a lot of money. No wonder when you go to Switzerland, it is so expensive. Singapore also comes out very high. So does Japan, South Korea, America, and you know if you look at these countries and if you look at the graph on the report, they're they're going up like this. South Korea is going up in the last few years. It's just just hardly it hardly dips at all. So does Switzerland. So does Indonesia. Um, you know th these countries are are definitely going places, and. Canada also is doing very well as well. So overall, look at the wealth around the world. Things are on, on the up. And I think what we, what we need to do is, is if you're starting a business, it's never been as easy to start a business as it is now. What you need to do is think about how you can get a share of this wealth. Can you create a product? It doesn't have to be a physical product. It could be a training product. It could be a book. It could be a report. It could be uh, a newsletter. What can you do to create your own wealth and, and, and build it up? Now, it's not all great. You know, there are some dark clouds on the horizon here and, and you've got to think about your future. Uh, the, the China trade war between Trump and China is, is escalating again. And in fact, uh, only yesterday, China said that they would 
They've ordered all of the government departments to remove all U.S. technology from their their their, their, their technology and their, their offices. And this will be a blow for HP, Dell and Microsoft. But that, that's what China did. And this comes kindly, partly in response to America banning Huawei from uh, installing systems in America due to, to the threat of spying. And, and I think they're correct to do that. And I think Britain should do the, the same uh, because things are not played on a level playing field in China. And so anyway, this, this could now mean a retaliation from America. So we, who knows what's going to happen. That could bring on a recession. Also, the, the WTO, America is refusing to appoint judges to the World Trade Organization. <clears throat> and it means that their, uh, their mediation system could grind to a halt in the next week unless America uh, pulls off a big U-turn. So we'll see what happens there. But in the meantime, I think the answer is you, you've got to create your own wealth. You've got to row your own boat. You've got to run your own economy and also be in a position that if things do go wrong, you're, you're ready to respond to it. You're not going to sort of crumble because, you know, we, we know that most people in the world are, you know, two, three paychecks away from disaster, away from homelessness. So that, that's a very sad state of affairs. And you, you've got to make put yourself in a position where, you know, you're not uh, going to be affected in that way. Um, there was a story the other day on uh, BBC's Panorama, which uh, featured a guy that, that said, um, you know, uh, it featured, it was talking about uh, uh, benefits and the universal credit. And it's come just a few days away from an election. So it's obviously the BBC uh, really being, being biased in a way and saying, Let, let's, let's highlight a story that is just before an election, really, Let's highlight a story that discredits the government. Now, the government a few years ago in the UK brought in universal credit uh, and, and many experts have admitted that it was the right thing to do because the previous benefit system was definitely being abused. Uh, people could, could sign off sick as disabled <clears throat> and never see another doctor, never see another benefits officer for years and just get income sent to them in the post or into their bank accounts. And, and they could just go to the pub every day and sit around enjoying... Uh, disability benefits for years and I, I know people that have been at it and uh, swinging the lead as they used to say I know people that have been uh, abusing the system and and not all of them were, were some of them were, were even migrants that have come. sorry about that I think we've got a little bit of interruption there so it needed to be looked at and perhaps in some areas they've gone too far perhaps they've uh, they've you know the hammer has come down too hard on some people and and that needs to be balanced out but definitely it was been abused. And, and, and Panorama featured a guy that had, <clears throat> he was in his 50s and he said, Look, I've worked all my life. Then I got sick. Then I had a heart problem. Now I can't work and I, I need the benefit system now. And we had to wait five weeks before we got any money. And, and, and it highlighted various problems that he'd had with universal credit. OK, uh, and then I thought to myself, well, if he'd worked all his life, what has he done with all his money? Where is it all gone? Why is it that five weeks wait for, a, for a, a bit of benefits is such a big problem? And in fact, he had to then take out a loan against the benefits, which is then has to be paid back. Well, that, well most loans do have to be paid back. Uh, and they featured several other people that, again, had worked all their life, but then they needed benefits and they got no money and they had to take out a loan. And in fact, in one case, uh, the citizen advice had advised someone to go bankrupt so that he he didn't have to pay back this loan to to the council when the council is eventually the taxpayer isn't it in fact the council fund uh my local council funds citizens advice and often citizen advice is biting the hand that feeds it because it advises people to go against the council in, in many ways and in this case it advised people in flincher to, to go bankrupt rather than pay back a loan to, to the council or to universal credit. He said, well, I've got no choice. You know, I've worked all my life, but I haven't got any money. So, OK, I'm not criticising those people in, in, in particular, but why not put yourself in a position where you don't have to be in that position? And that's by saving a percentage of your income to put in something aside so that you don't feel that, you know, after working all your life, you've got nothing to show for it. And think about some of the risks that can happen. You know, do you think that in your life... 
there's a chance, right? Just, just, just think about it. Do you think that in your life there's a chance that some disaster may befall you? Do you think there's something that, do you think in your life something could go wrong? Yeah? Based on past experience, based on, on, on experience from families, do you think you might have a health problem? Do you think you might possibly lose your job at some stage? Do you think automation might take over your job? Well, yeah. Do you think that, that some disaster might befall you, that something's going to go wrong, some, some bit of crap is going to come your way? Well, well, of course it does. It always does, especially when things are going well. Something is always you know, there to, to sort of hit you in the teeth when things are going, uh, are going well. You think, right, things are going well, I can relax now, then boom, something happens. It's just part of life, isn't it? It's part of the way of nature, maybe. You know, nature has its ups and downs. The seasons come and go. You have summer one minute, then you're in the depth of winter. So things are going to happen. And, and Jim Rohn used to say this, that your job is to build a financial wall around your family that no one can break through. Because he, he talked about the seasons, didn't he? He talked about, you know, the, the summer when everyone's relaxing. But no, the farmer is perhaps planting seed for, for the next thing or he's, he's bringing in the harvest. You know, farmers don't relax. They they prepare for the next season. And, and, it, and it's a very good way of describing how we should be in life. Because as soon as you relax and think, right, there you go, I don't have to do anything more, then things are going to go wrong. In fact, it's even in a Bible story, isn't it? That, you know, the man said, I've got enough store in my grain for 20 years, I'm now going to relax, you know. And it was even known 2,000 years ago that you can't sort of sit back for, for too long. You can't sort of sit too long at the table of success and toast your success. You've got to keep keep moving on and keep moving forward and keep preparing for the worst. And, and, and even then, look at your health, for instance. Do you think if you smoke and drink a lot and eat fatty foods that you, you're going to have a health problem in the future? Well, we know this. The jury's out on this. Yeah, you see something every day saying a glass of red wine is good for you or chocolate's good for you or drinking a lot of coffee is good for you. But look, we know what's good for us. We know that the kind of sugary, fatty foods and processed foods are not good for us. We know that drinking too much alcohol, and we know the safety guidelines for alcohol, and we know that smoking and even vaping is bad for you. So if people do that, they know that at some stage in their life they're going to have a health problem. So what are you doing to prepare for that? Because yes, we have the, the NHS in the UK, but if you're off work for a long period of time, what have you got in the bank to, to, to support that? Or have you got insurance to cover you against sickness? And if the answer is no, then you, you're really uh, looking for trouble in the future. You know, we know that the average savings in the UK is less than £10,000. We know that debt is, is probably twice that uh, average debt. So we're heading for trouble if you, you know, abuse your finances, you abuse your body, uh, and you don't take care of yourself, you don't do enough exercise, then you are heading for trouble. We know that if people don't take at least 30 minutes exercise two or three times a week, you're heading for trouble. And because I know that even people who are keep healthy can still have an illness. So what about these people who are not healthy? I was sitting next to a, a, a lady in a restaurant the other day and she said, I drink every day. And I was just over here in this conversation. I drink every day. My dad was a drunk. Uh, I'm a drunk. She didn't say I'm a drunk, but she said, I drink every day after work. And I don't care what what happens to me. You know, it's that kind of devil may care that, you know, I'll drink and smoke and I don't care what the consequences are. Well, someone's going to have to pay for that. The NHS is going to have to pay for that. The taxpayers are going to have to pay for that. And probably if you if you take that casual attitude, it's uh, the benefit system is going to have to look after you. And that's what I'm saying is be prepared for these disasters. Don't just sit back and say, well, things will be OK. You know, you've got to put some money aside. And that's why I wrote this book. Yes, money can buy you happiness because money can buy you happiness, but it can also, if you haven't got any money, it's, it's a very unhappy situation. So that's why I wrote this book. I talked about money management. I talked about putting something aside. I talked about managing your money so that you have money in times of need and you can enjoy money. And, and money can bring you happiness. Not the money itself, not that, you know, looking at money is going to make you happy, but the things that money can buy, the security money can buy, the security for you and your family, that money that you've got aside. So when a disaster does occur, when you or a family member gets a serious illness, that you've got the money to deal with it, not necessarily through private health care, but just through having the money to, to take those taxis to, to the hospital rather than trying to get the bus, or money you have to, to deal with a period where you can't work or you're recovering from an illness. It could be 
three months, it could be six months, it could be a year. Make sure you have the money to deal with that. And, and as I said, that's why I think it's important to follow the, the advice in this book, Yes, Money Can Buy You Happiness. So go and have a look at that. You know, you can get it on Amazon for, a, for a, you know, five or six dollars, I think, on, 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 uh, on, on the Kindle version. So it's, it's not a lot of money to invest in your, in your future or give it to someone as a Christmas present. Get the, 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 the paperback for £10, I think. Give it to someone as a Christmas present who, who maybe needs to know how to manage their, their money. So thanks for listening today uh, and, and I, I hope you're having a good day. Uh, think about your money. Think about how you manage your money and, and don't be one of these people who say, where did it all go? Know where you, what money's coming in and know what money's going out in your life. And that, that's the advice I would follow in, you can follow in Yes, Money Can Buy You Happiness. Thanks for listening and bye for now. Have a great day. By the way, I just, just want to add quickly that if you're interested in knowing how you can build your wealth and you'd like to uh, take a course on, on this and, and learn more about it, if you're in the UK, we have some free taster courses in learning how to, to invest in property and become a property investor. These are very interesting uh, taste of courses because it can open your eyes to how you can get into property and how you can learn more about property, but without using your own money. You can build a property portfolio without using your own money and using other people's money, using various strategies like joint venturing, where you can build a substantial property. Like, like for instance, like Rob Moore did. He owns 600, owns or controls 600 properties. And he started with nothing but debt, like Kevin MacDonald, who was £130,000 in debt. In fact, he was so much in debt, he couldn't borrow any money. So he had to use other people's money. He couldn't go out and get a mortgage, I mean. He couldn't raise any deposit. So he had to find creative strategies to go out and use other people's money to build a property portfolio. And, and now he, he, he earns a million pounds a year from his property portfolio. So, so there you go. You can learn these strategies too. Uh, I want you to be able to, to learn how to do that. So if, you, if you're interested, just drop me a line on Facebook Messenger or email me at charles at charleskelly.net. That's charles at charleskelly.net. This could change your life. Take the first step by just emailing me and I'll, I'll send you some information. Thanks very much and bye for now.